Most forest visitors and wildlife are unaware of the furious activity taking place several hundred feet below. Coal, one of our country's most important energy resources. In the state of Utah, coal is produced almost exclusively from underground mines using the most advanced and safe underground mining equipment and technology. Total production of coal in the United States has reached one billion tons annually. Coal currently provides approximately one-third of our total national energy needs. The number one use of coal is the generation of electricity in coal-fired electric power plants. Coal-fired power plants provide approximately 60% of the total electrical energy produced in the United States. Of the other uses, steel production and heating of commercial and domestic buildings are the most common. More than 20 million tons of coal are produced annually from Utah coal mines. This accounts for only about 2% of our country's total coal production. But the importance of Utah coal for energy production and the demand are steadily increasing. In Utah, coal is produced from private, state, and federal lands. Approximately 84% of Utah coal production is from federal leases. The majority is mined from the Wasatch Plateau coal field, which lies beneath the Manti LaSalle National Forest. Coal production has been an important component of Utah's economy since the Mormon settlers moved into the area in the mid-1800s. They discovered coal deposits along cliff outcrops and developed these easily accessible coal deposits to heat their homes. Development of a rail system through Utah in the late 1800s led to the industrial mining of Utah coal. Even with the replacement of the coal-fired steam engines by diesel engines in the 1940s, the demand for Utah coal continued and grew with the demand for electricity and coking coal for iron and steel production. Today, you can still find remnants of some of the early mines. Utah coal is becoming more important due to its high heat production, clean burning characteristics, and low sulfur content. Sulfur dioxide, SO2, is expelled into the air as a result of combustion of fossil fuels such as oil, gas, and coal, which contain sulfur. The use of low sulfur coal for electrical power generation could reduce SO2 emissions and decrease the cost of producing electricity. The demand for coal by other countries is expected to increase steadily in the near future. Utah's close proximity to seaports on the west coast makes Utah coal more competitive for development and export. Coal is found in near horizontal seams within the rock layers of the Earth's crust. It is mostly composed of carbon, which is the main element in all living or organic materials. Dense vegetation which grew around ancient swamps and bogs died and was deposited on the ground as part of the continuing life cycle. This process can be observed today in existing swamps and bogs. Over many thousands of years, thick layers of dead and decaying vegetation accumulated. As the ancient geological environments changed, thick layers of sediment were deposited over the layers of the carbon-rich organic material which was derived from the vegetation. Under high pressures and temperatures exerted by geological processes, the carbon-rich organic materials were consolidated into layers of coal. Several coal seams can occur, one on top of the other, representing separate periods of vegetation accumulation and sediment deposition. Nearly all coal mining in Utah is done by underground mining methods, with portal facilities located along coal outcrops on canyon slopes. Tunnels, known as underground entries, are driven into the coal seams to provide access to the coal reserves. The openings of these entries are referred to as mine portals. 
Entries can extend laterally several miles into the mountains and plateaus. Less than 1% of the mined area is disturbed for construction of surface and transportation facilities. A large portion of lands being mined in Utah are managed under a multiple use management scheme by the Forest Service, an agency of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. These lands were originally set aside from other public lands to ensure favorable conditions of water flow and to ensure production of renewable resources such as timber and wildlife. Current management of national forest system lands calls for balanced management of resources and resource uses. National forest system lands produce a variety of resources critical to our national and local economy, such as timber, minerals, high quality water, and forage for wildlife and livestock. These lands also provide a playground for thousands of recreational visitors each year. In order to ensure that activities, including mining, are done with the least conflict with other resources and to make sure that unnecessary environmental impacts do not occur, certain requirements must be met and environmental analysis must be conducted before permits authorizing planned activities can be issued. Obtaining a permit to mine is a detailed and complex process. On lands where the mineral resources are managed by the federal or state governments, the mining company must obtain a lease which gives it the right to mine the coal. Before the lease is issued, an environmental analysis must be conducted to determine the potential effects to other resources and to the human environment, which could result from a mining operation. On federal lands, including National Forest System lands, the U.S. Department of Interior Bureau of Land Management is responsible for administration of the federal mineral leasing laws and to issue and administer the lease. On state lands, the state is responsible for administration of leases. Once an area is cleared for leasing, the proposed lease track is sold to the highest bidder. The mining company must prepare a mining and reclamation plan for mining the lease area, which meets federal and state laws and regulations for mining. In Utah, the Utah Division of Oil, Gas and Mining is the lead agency responsible for evaluation and issuance of mine permits. Qualified specialists from several regulatory agencies work together with the mining company to prepare and evaluate the mining and reclamation plan, provide for public safety, and minimize environmental impacts. On national forest system lands, the Forest Service must consent to approval of the mining and reclamation plan prior to permit issuance. The Bureau of Land Management is responsible for compliance with lease terms and to assure maximum economic recovery of the coal resource. The mining permit is issued only after the mining and reclamation plan is determined to be technically adequate and environmentally sound. The first stages of developing a mine include implementation of resource studies and measures needed to minimize impacts. These include salvaging topsoil for replacement during reclamation, construction of sediment control facilities, and implementation of special measures needed to protect wildlife from the effects of mining. Resource study and monitoring programs are implemented and will continue throughout operations to detect impacts when they occur and take appropriate measures needed to mitigate them. The method of mining and configuration of mine workings used are determined considering coal occurrence, geologic, economic, and environmental factors. Mining machines called continuous miners are used to drive entries. The process of constructing the main entries and underground workings is called development mining. Blocks of coal known as panels are developed for mining, which are then extracted using a room and pillar mining configuration. Once the panels are developed, recovery mining is employed during retreat. Coal remaining in the pillars is partially recovered, leaving just enough coal in the pillars to support the roof until the area is abandoned. Using exclusively the room and pillar mining method, as much as 800 tons can be produced in an eight-hour shift by an eight-person crew. A more efficient method, called long wall mining, is used where conditions are favorable. As much as 6,000 tons of coal can be produced in an eight-hour shift by an eight-person crew. Room and pillar development mining is employed to block out large rectangular panels of coal to be completely extracted using the long wall method. 
Individual panels can reach dimensions of 800 feet wide by 8,000 feet long. An oscillating shear advances into the panel cutting coal. The long wall operators work the controls from a safe area just behind the shear which is located under linear sets of advancing hydraulic roof supports called long wall shields. The roof of the mined out area collapses immediately behind the advancing shields. The coal cut by the shears at the mining face drops into a chain conveyor which transports the coal laterally to a belt conveyor in the main entry or headgate. Mining of large underground areas results in caving of the mine roof. As this occurs, the overlaying rock layers are fractured and the ground surface above the mined area is often lowered. This process is called subsidence. In most cases, as shown in this area which has been subsided by approximately 13 feet, there is no indication that subsidence has occurred. Cracking of the ground surface does occur in some instances. Monitoring of cracks has shown that they tend to heal naturally over a period of a few years. Large blocks of coal are left unmined, or full support mining is employed where surface features have been identified for protection from mining-induced subsidence. Where subsidence is an acceptable result of mining, long wall mining is usually the preferred method. It is more efficient and subsidence occurs more rapidly and even, with less disruption of the ground surface. This is called controlled subsidence. The coal mining laws and regulations require that mine operators conduct subsidence and resource monitoring programs. Partnerships between the mining operators and the regulatory agencies have been developed so that the effects of underground mining and subsidence can be predicted and monitored using scientific methods. Where facilities such as roads, buildings and pipelines lie on the surface above mining, partnerships can be developed between the operators of the facilities and the mining companies to allow subsidence and make necessary repairs to the facilities in the event that damage occurs. This provides for maximum recovery of the coal and adequate preservation of the facilities for their intended uses. Important from an economic standpoint, but there are other associated economic benefits. The mines and other related industries which use coal or provide products needed for mining provide employment opportunities which are vital to Utah's economy. Coal mined from federal and state coal leases results in significant economic returns to the public. The returns are in the form of bonus bid payments, annual lease payments, and coal royalties. Of the coal receipts which are obtained from federal coal, 50% is retained by the federal government and the other 50% is returned to the state. Half of the state's share is returned to local governments. Coal mining is considered to be a short-term use of the environment, even though mining operations may have a life of more than 40 years. When the coal in a particular mining area is mined out and additional reserves needed to extend the life of the operation are not available, the mine area must be returned to pre-mining land use. The company which conducted the mining operation is responsible for reclamation of its mine area. The first step of mine land reclamation is to remove all the underground mining equipment and facilities. All of the mine openings are then plugged and sealed to prevent further access to the mined area. Some facilities for draining or blocking water movement throughout the abandoned mine workings may be necessary. The next step is to remove mining-related surface facilities, such as buildings, conveyor belts, storage silos, and roads. On federal and state lands, the land is usually returned to the approximate pre-mining contour. Contaminated wastes and soil materials are either treated or hauled to an approved disposal facility. Other earth materials, which are not conducive to promoting plant growth, are buried in strategic areas to ensure adequate depth of cover. When recontouring is complete, for reclamation will then be redistributed over the recontoured area. All drainages are restored and erosion control structures are installed. The last stage of reclamation is to revegetate the disturbed area with plant species which are compatible with the surrounding environment and the intended post-mining land use. 
The operator is responsible for monitoring the success of reclamation in conjunction with the regulatory agencies. They are also responsible for any necessary additional reclamation and erosion control measures until the required post-mining reclamation standards are obtained. Once reclamation has been determined to be successful, there will be little evidence that a mining operation occurred in the area. Many years ago, before the mining industry was properly regulated, there were no requirements for reclamation of mined areas before they were abandoned. In order to reclaim these areas, the coal industry and the regulatory authorities are cooperating in an abandoned mine land reclamation program. In addition to coal royalties, the mine companies pay 15 cents per ton of coal mined into a national mine land reclamation fund. This money is then distributed to individual states for reclamation of abandoned mines. Coal mining is a necessary use of our available public lands and is an important and equal component of the multiple use land management scheme. The land area which is dedicated exclusively to underground mining operations for the life of the operation is very small relative to the entire area mined. Other land users are usually not aware that coal is being mined several hundred feet beneath their feet. Coal mining is generally compatible with other uses of the land and resource production. With proper planning, regulation, and monitoring of mining operations, the impacts which occur can be minimized. The development of partnerships between coal operators, other land users, the surface management agency, and regulatory agencies can result in maximizing coal recovery with very little disruption or impact to other resources and resource uses. Everyone benefits. The coal resource extracted is used to produce energy and provide jobs for the American people, while other resources and resource uses are preserved for the use 